From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus with Paul Salem. Hi, I'm Paul Salem, and welcome to MEI's Middle East Focus. This will be the last podcast of the year, so we're going to do things slightly differently. I'm going to be interviewing a number of our scholars separately on the issues they work on and look back with them at the main events of 2017. Please stay with us. 2017, as as has always been in the Middle East, uh, quite eventful. On this side, we had uh, the incoming administration of President Donald Trump and a lot of developments that had great effects in the region, on the region. President Trump campaigned on a rather anti-Muslim platform, but then once in office, his main visit was to Riyadh, to Saudi Arabia, meeting with leaders of the Islamic world, cementing an alliance there largely against Iran. Uh, He also pivoted on the issue of the nuclear deal with Iran, at least half of a pivot, uh, decertified from his end the deal and kicked the ball to Congress. That is still an issue that's uh, in play. On ISIS, uh, he continued sort of Obama policy and ratcheted it up with a war to defeat ISIS both in Mosul and Raqqa, Mosul in Iraq and uh, Raqqa in Syria, a positive achievement there. Uh, and ended the year with a announcement of recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. We did a podcast on that uh, this past week. He kind of rang out the year with that. Uh, so a lot of changes there. Uh, in this podcast, I'll be talking with a number of our scholars about these uh, and other issues. So please stay with us uh, for the end of year review. We're here with Ambassador Jerry Firestein, who's uh, head of Gulf Studies and the Government Relations at the Middle East Institute, also a retired U.S. diplomat, uh, served as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Near East, and uh, Ambassador in Yemen uh, during the first years of the uprising and the transition. Jerry, thank you for being with us at Pleasure, this, uh, on this podcast. A very eventful year in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, from Trump's uh, inaugural visit, changes in Saudi, terrible conflict in Yemen, and, and, and tension with Qatar. How do you see 2017? What are the main turning points and takeaways. Well, absolutely. I agree with you, Paul. And and in fact, what I would say is that this was probably the most eventful year in the Arabian Peninsula, maybe for the last 50 years. Wow. What we've seen in terms of uh, Saudi domestic political, economic, and social reform, much more aggressive Saudi position on foreign policy issues, uh, ranging from Yemen to the uh, confrontation with Qatar and the intervention in Lebanon's internal politics, as well as the cooperation that we've seen develop between the Crown Prince Mohammed bin uh, Salman and uh, Jared Kushner. And then, of course, as you mentioned, the the terrible conflict in Yemen. Well, let's uh, zero in for a little bit on what the Crown Prince is doing. How would you describe it? Is it a power grab? Is it a revolution from above, as some, some have called it? Is it? What are the elements and how is it going, do you think? Well, I, I think that what we've seen over the past year is, is uh, Mohammed bin Salman, clearly a young man with, uh, with a vision. And the vision encompasses two aspects. One, of course, domestically, he uh, believes correctly, I think, in the view of most analysts, that uh, Saudi Arabia needs fundamental reforms, economic diversification, social reform, to try to, to uh, bring the, uh, the society into a sustainable position for the future. And then on the other side, uh, we've seen a much more aggressive foreign policy stance on, on his part. And I think it's a view that Saudi Arabia has been in a sense, underperforming over these last decades, and and that has it has not achieved the status uh, or the international recognition that it deserves, based on its important political and and economic uh, situation. Well, on the foreign policy, how much do you think is it sort of driven by you know I, I mean obviously it must be to a large degree by the crown prince, the king himself, and what they want to do, and how much was it? you know, related to the change of government in the U.S., President Trump's big visit. I mean, it seemed that the Saudi leadership took encouragement or took heart, as it were, from the Trump administration or Jared Kushner. And yet on many of the initiatives, the U.S. didn't end up 
being on the same side. How do you read that relationship? Well, absolutely, that was uh, that was a factor. I, I think that the uh, that the Saudis also recognized that there was a vacuum among the Sunni Arab uh, powers. Egypt was no longer uh, a strong uh, player. Syria, Iraq. Uh, and so when the Trump administration arrived, they saw this as an opportunity, really, given the fact that in many ways there was a uh, a shared uh, perception of, of the threats from violent extremism and from Iran. And they managed to build this close relationship. And yet at the same time, as you say, when you translate that broad understanding and agreement between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia down to the specific elements of uh, policy decisions, there have been several instances where uh, we have ended up in uh, separate corners, Lebanon being the most recent example, the willingness of the White House for the first time to criticize Saudi Arabia's performance in, in Yemen, the uh, disagreement over how to manage the uh, the situation with Qatar, uh, and of so course, a lot of differences. Well, yeah, and yeah. on the, going the other way, of course, you had Saudi Arabia distancing itself from the Trump administration's Jerusalem announcement. Mm -hmm. So uh, on both sides, uh, I think there's a realization that even though we both want to move in the same direction, there are going to be differences. So is it a romance that seems to be ending, or just a few rocky? Rocky Roads. Well, it's a good question. I think that one of the things that has always struck me is that when you do have a translation into a much more tangible uh, transactional arrangement, we and the Saudis aren't necessarily on the same page. And the question is, how significant is that going to become in 2018? Uh, are we going to continue to see further close cooperation and coordination between Saudi Arabia and the U.S., or is there going to be some distancing and some mutual frustration? Mm -hmm. Well, we'll talk about 2018 in our next podcast, but uh, we're looking back uh, in this one. Let's turn to the horrific situation in Yemen. It's been a, a, been a very disastrous year in terms of humanitarian loss of life, uh, cholera disease, uh, risk of famine. What are the main sort of turning points, issues that a lot did go on in Yemen and around Yemen this year? Well, fundamentally, the story in Yemen up until uh, the last couple of weeks has been one of stalemate, a, a, a lack of movement on either side. Uh, militarily, uh, both sides have been entrenched and, and uh, really not able to achieve much uh, progress. On the political side, the uh, negotiations have been frozen. Uh, there really wasn't uh, much uh, change or willingness to negotiate. The dramatic development, of course, of uh, 10 days ago, the uprising in Sana'a, short-lived, and then, of course, the, the murder of Ali Abdullah Saleh by the Houthis, upends the situation uh, to how a certain so? extent. How does it change things? Well, I, I think that, one, it, it probably makes the political process more complicated in some ways, but it also strips away from the Houthis some of the cover, some of the, uh, the legitimacy or credibility that they might have had in presenting themselves as a broad-based movement. And it really kind of focuses the Houthis as a very narrow kind sectarian... Kind of isolates them a little bit. It yeah. isolates them as a sectarian organization, heavily dependent on the relationship with Iran and with Hezbollah, and really not representative of where the vast majority of Yemenis are. Mm -hmm. I mean, Yemen now is the biggest humanitarian disaster crisis in the world, uh, surpassing Syria. Uh, what is the U.S. doing about it? Why haven't efforts to prioritize humanitarian relief succeeded, or have they succeeded, you know, in bits and pieces, and what can we learn from that? Well, I, I think that, that to a certain extent, we've seen the international community doing what it could. Uh, there is a great deal of humanitarian relief going into Yemen, but it's not enough, and it can't be enough. Uh, you, we're really not going to see a concerted resolution of the humanitarian crisis until we have progress on stopping the fighting and, uh, and a political process to, uh, to get back to a transition plan. Uh, and that's the, the fundamental reality. Ambassador Firestein, I want to thank you for being with us today. We'll continue this discussion about 2018 in our next podcast. Uh, but thank you for your insights about uh, Arabian Peninsula developments and the, the situation in Yemen. Thank you for being with us. Welcome. 
Very happy to welcome Dr. Gunil Tol, director of our Turkish program here at the Middle East Institute. Gunil, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Paul. 2017, a turbulent year again in Turkey and in Turkish-U.S. relations. There was a referendum in the spring that potentially changes the constitution. Still repercussions from the coup of last year and developments be with the new Trump administration and so on. How does 2017 look to you as a Turkey watcher? Well, I want to start with my first point, which is Turkey transitioned from an illiberal democracy to uh, a competitive authoritarian regime. Oh, those are two fancy terms. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Help me, help me out here. Sure. Well, in, in an illiberal democracy, the civil liberties uh, do not exist, but there are still fair, uh, free and competitive elections. That's what you say what it was. It was. It yes. used to be an illiberal democracy. But with a competitive authoritarian regime, that's not the case, which means there are no civil l- liberties and also it's not an elections are not are free, not fair. actually free and fair. So uh, how are they? not free and fair? Was the referendum not free and fair? Well, many believe that it was rigged. He won by a small margin and there were irregularities and that were documented by international organizations. So there was a lot of concern around that. So now the belief in Turkey is that they're not. So you're calling it a competitive autocracy? Although it doesn't. Authoritarian regime, yes. Competitive autocracy authoritarian regime, it it doesn't seem very competitive in the sense that I don't see anybody able to actually compete. Opposition figures, some are in jail and, you know, many are in jail, actually. What's competitive about it? That is true, but still institutions are there in form, but not in substance. So there are still opposition parties, there is still media, there is still the judiciary, but they are under the control of the ruling party. Is it a bit like the Russian kind of system, you think, which is maybe... Well, let's say a few words. I mean, uh, President Erdogan and President Putin a few years ago were enemies uh, and, the Ru- and the Turks shot down a Russian plane and now they seem best buddies. Uh, is that a 2017 development of note for Russia? For it Turkey? is. And it is partly due to Turkey's frustrations over the West. So now Turkey and Russia are working very closely in Syria and Turkey is cultivating closer energy ties and even defense ties with Russia. Since you mentioned it, frustration with the West, I assume you mean both the EU and the US. That's true. Are they over the same issues? No, different. I mean, with the US, the tension started under the Obama administration over Washington's decision to arm the Syrian Kurdish militia. And uh, the Trump administration went a step further and decided to directly arm the PYD. And there are also other problems on the agenda. When is the extradition of Fethullah Gülen, the Islamic cleric who resides in Pennsylvania? And also recently, the U.S. uh, took an unprecedented step and decided to suspend visa services because the consular staff in Turkey were arrested by Turkish authorities and uh, and the U- U.S. administration was very concerned about that. I mean, President Erdogan was very happy to see President Trump come to the White House, but has nothing come of that? Um, not really. I, there is now uh, even more frustration because the expectations from the new administration was quite high. Of course, Trump did not deliver. And that's one of the reasons why Turkey decided to turn to Russia. But with the European Union, I think the problems are more structural. The European countries are are even more concerned about human rights violations and the state of Turkish democracy. And also, I think there is the the rise of uh, far right parties in 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 Europe, in Europe yeah. and that is that is that is a problem uh, in terms of EU's relationship with Turkey. Uh, let me turn sort of finally to Turkey's regional uh, politics. Was this the year? Well, I mean, we did have the uh, Kurdish referendum in northern Iraq and uh, sort of changes in the relationship between Erbil and Ankara. Also, it seems that Turkey has given up on transition in Syria and is very concerned over just northern Syria. How do you view the changes in Turkish policy vis-a-vis Iraq and Syria? Now Turkey is on the defensive and it's very marginalized, both in Iraq and in Syria. And now it's, uh, especially in Syria, it's operating under the umbrella of Russia. So uh, Turkey's Syria policy is almost at the mercy of Russia. And in in Iraq, uh, President Barzani was Turkey's closest ally and the only ally in Iraq. But after the referendum and uh, in the process leading up to the referendum, Turkey was fiercely opposed uh, and now President Barzani is out and the KRG is struggling with many problems and quite weakened. So that leaves Turkey without a partner in Iraqi politics. Mm -hmm. Any changes this year to the relations with Iran? 
Well, uh, with Russia, uh, Turkey has been working very closely with Iran as well in Syria. They are the ones who came up with the de-escalation zones. So there is close partnership, but there is always, you have to remember that despite the close partnership between these two countries, there is always competition and tension behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Uh, any, uh, what's your view of U.S. policy towards Turkey with this new administration? You've talked about the frustrations from the Turkish side. Did this administration, whether the White House or the uh, Secretary of State, come up with anything fresh or new uh, in contrast to the last years of the Obama administration? Not really. I think both parties, both Washington and Ankara, have resigned themselves to the fact that this is a transactional relationship. So the Trump administration's number one priority is the fight against ISIS. So having access to Injirlik and having, Turkey's, having Turkey on board in the fight against ISIS are the two critical goals for this administration. And as long as Turkey is on board on those two, I don't think the Trump administration really cares about what's going on in Turkey or even Turkey's large Larger foreign policy objectives. Gunil Tol, director of our Turkey program, uh, thank you for being with us on this podcast. My pleasure. Thank you. Very happy to uh, welcome Alex Vatanka. Alex, thanks for, for joining us on the podcast. Thanks, Paul. Alex heads our Iran program here at the Middle East Institute. Eventful year for Iran also, as uh, usual. Uh, big elections, uh, President Rouhani winning a second term. Big elections in the U.S. in the sense that Iran had to deal with a new administration uh, in the U.S., as well as developments, certainly in the region and so on. How did the year look to you as an Iran uh, observer? I mean, let's uh, for a second pretend that we are one of those enthusiastic uh, supporters of Hassan Rouhani. Mm. And if you look at him as the guy who is supposed to come in and deliver on reform at home, the period up to May 19th when the elections uh, took place were full of excitement. Rouhani was promising. A lot of promises. A lot of promises. Things are going to change. Your average Iranian voter will actually have make say, Iran great again. Make Iran great again version mm -hmm. and uh, and the election happened. Twenty four million people voted for Rouhani. This was huge. This was a landslide. Mm -hmm. But then, what has he actually delivered since? And that's where your reformist enthusiasm have simply disappeared. Mm. He's been a so huge what happened? He's been a huge disappointment. Rouhani, knowing he's not going to have to run for office again. This is his second ter and last term. Mm -hmm. He's already setting his eyes on the higher job in the Islamic Republic, and that's the position of the supreme leader. Mm -hmm. He's calculated, I don't need the reformist base. I need the hardliners in the bureaucracy of the So regime. how is he politicizing that, I mean, maneuvering? Let's let's take a, a, a very specific example. He's done nothing to push back against the hardliners in the Revolutionary Guards in particular when they go about in their region and pursue their foreign policy ambitions. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, what are we doing in Syria? What are we doing in Yemen? Have we thought about this? Can we afford, for instance, be involved in the reconstruction? He's given of, them more he's leash. He's given way, not only leeway, he's yeah. thanking them. He's mm -hmm. saying to them, you are the heroes. Without you, we'll have to deal with Daesh in the streets of Tehran. This is a very different message post-election than what he used to say to the... Does that have political repercussions in, I mean, the voters vote once every four years, right, in the presidential right. election, but does it matter that he's reneging on... Well, look, if you believe that unless there is reform inside the regime instigated by the authorities themselves, if there isn't enough of that, then you will end up with something like Iran's version of Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. that people will simply come back to the streets the so way they did in 2009. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the big calculation the regime has to make, including Rouhani, because he knows those 24 million people who came to vote for him didn't vote uh, because of Iran's interventions mm -hmm. in Yemen and in Syria and in Iraq. They voted for reform at home above all. And he's not delivering on that. Let me ask you, dealing with uh, the new administration in the U.S., how, how have you observed that? Uh, what yeah. are your takeaways from this year? Remember, they were initially pretty optimistic that they could cut deals with Mr. Trump. Uh, but I think as months have gone on, they are less and less sure that that's ever going to be possible. Mm -hmm. Instead, what the Iranian uh, authorities are hoping they can do is to create enough wedge between the Europeans, the Americans, that Trump's Iran policy, whatever mm -hmm. that ends up being, and we don't really know what that fundamental Iran policy by this Trump administration will look like, but whatever it is, that the Iranians can bring the Europeans 
more towards them and away from the Americans. That's the hope in Tehran. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to some of the latest statements by the French president, the British, the Germans, there is enough skepticism about what Trump is doing in the realm of foreign policy that the Iranians might just be right on this. Well, let me ask about U.S. policy towards Iran. Will this be the year that the U.S. began to pull out of the nuclear deal or the year that it became clear that it's not going to pull out? How do you read it? We're still, you know, at the end of December. It was Congress was supposed to act. How how does that look to you? I mean, a lot of this comes down to how much political capital this U.S. president has in the U.S. Congress. Mm -hmm. I think the U.S. Congress could do a lot of damage to the deal if it chooses to or if it chooses to go down that path. But I'm not sure it, it, if it will. Uh, I think the Europeans in particular are critical in this. They seem to have a lot of sympathy for some of the arguments that come out of the Trump administration that Iran's ballistic missile program really doesn't need to be this big at this scale right now, that what the Iranians are doing in the region doesn't need to be at this scale either. In other words, that it's right to ask for concessions from Tehran. I think the Europeans have sympathy with that. But I'm not sure the Europeans believe Trump administration really has a strategy in place that is holistic, that looks at not just Iran, but the broader region as a whole. And that's where it becomes tricky. You can't deal with Iran just in its borders. Iran is everywhere in the mm -hmm. Middle East. Mm -hmm. Let's just take the decision on Jerusalem. This yeah, was, this was a huge yeah, own so, goal yeah, uh, by the Trump administration. I mean, it really weakened anybody that's a moderate voice in that part of the world. And it emboldens radical voices. The Iranians could not thank Trump enough. In fact, uh, one of the key advisors to Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei came out and had a newspaper headline that said, everybody ought to uh, pray for Mr. Trump's health. In other words, this man is well, delivering. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this man is delivering for Somebody's the hardliners agenda yeah. in Tehran. Final question. You did mention the voters uh, and uh, maybe they're the disappointment of those who wanted reform. Maybe looking at sort of the economy and sort of daily life. Uh, uh, I mean, obviously, the nuclear deal, when it was signed, raised hopes of economic improvement and job creation and so on. What's your kind of socioeconomic read of Iran this year? Things are now working well for the Rouhani government. I mean, he's pursuing very conservative fiscal policies, very different from the sort of populist policies of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. But simple, simple fact is there is not enough oil money. He cannot do what Ahmadinejad, who benefited from about $150 a barrel of oil, he can't do those sorts of things. So there is a lot of disappointment. The sanctions haven't really resulted in the trickle-down economics. There was a lot of hope. That he would. So what he's instead having to do is to tighten budgetary mechanisms back home, which is hurting the middle class more than anybody else. The banking reform in particular is getting people upset. They're losing money. So yeah, I mean, if you had two things that you wanted Rouhani to deliver was political reform and fix the economy, well, he's not doing either right now. Alex Vatenka, thank you very much for joining us uh, on this podcast. Thank you, Paul. Happy to welcome uh, my colleague Charles Lister. Charles is the director of the Extremism and Counterterrorism Program here at the Middle East Institute and also uh, works a lot on Syria in addition. Uh, Charles, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Paul. Good to be here. Uh, we're looking back at uh, events of this year. Uh, let me start with, I mean, obviously it was a big year in terms of the war on ISIS. What were the accomplishments? Where do we stand? Well, it has been a very big year. It's been a fairly successful year, I would say, in terms of the fight against ISIS. Obviously, the two big targets, Raqqa and Mosul, both were liberated um, by the US-led coalition and our partner forces on the ground. That in and of itself is significant. But I think we've seen a number of other significant developments in Iraq. I think the Iraqis really took the role on for themselves increasingly as 2017 went on um, for you know with good consequences, but also raising various questions in terms of the future of the the Hashta Shabi forces, popular and so mobilization the popular mobilization there, yeah. units, the PMUs, and that's in Iraq. And then in Syria, I think what we've seen develop more in terms of the latter part of 2017 is the increasingly significant role of the Assad regime, Russia and Iran, in terms of liberating the final bits of ISIS territory in eastern Syria. Well, let's Syria. look at the territory a little bit. In Iraq, there apparently there's no major territory left with ISIS. Is that correct? Yeah. So, so the Iraqis have essentially declared victory against ISIS in terms of the territorial battle on the ground. Yes. And in Syria, where are the patches that are left? So the few patches left are in uh, sort of northern Hama area where there's the regime, there's the opposition, there's Al-Qaeda and there's ISIS all intermixed in different areas in northern Hama in a specific pocket there. And then there's also in Deir Azor, um, ongoing fighting between ISIS and the regime um, 
in areas around Al Mayadeen and are various pockets of area uh, of territory along the Euphrates River. So in Syria, they still hold some territory. Do you expect that to be lost by them in the next months? Um, I think it's an open question. Um, I, I don't want to sound too conspiratorial, but the Assad regime has had a reason to allow ISIS to remain minimally operational in different uh, times over the last five or six years. And they they do appear to have allowed ISIS to operate in this hammer pocket, mostly because ISIS's fighters there are fighting the opposition, not the Assad regime. And the question over Deir Azor is an open one because we know, as the US coalition did around Raqqa, there have been a series of negotiation, ne- negotiated agreements for ISIS withdrawals to different areas of the country. So there appears to be a willingness to allow them to continue to survive in one way or another. So but there might be part of the game still to play. Potentially, but there'll be a shadow, a vastly question, smaller shadow. Two questions about ISIS. One, how big was the blow that they lost their caliphate? They lost the state, which was their big claim to fame when they first surged to prominence in 2014. How big a blow is that? And a related question, what is ISIS 2.0 or ISIS post the caliphate? Well, the territorial defeat of the caliphate is is hugely strategically significant. I mean, it does show that as if you are a jihadist group and you're going to try to establish something like this, it's almost impossible to sustain it over a particularly long period, you know, longer than two or three years. Um, but having said that, the fact that they established it at all has given them something that really no terrorist organization has had in modern history, which is this almost unparalleled ability to... Um, inspire attacks all around the world. And it's now become the norm that the terrorist attacks we're seeing conducted in America and in Europe are being conducted by people who are almost entirely inspired by the internet. They haven't had any direct contact with ISIS. That's really a new phenomenon. And that inspired we're by the internet to ISIS. Yes, I, I mean, ISIS, ISIS propaganda is the brand on still. the internet. Yeah, yeah. So this idea of an online caliphate still existing in its supporters' minds is still very, very much alive. And that's the danger that we'll continue to face. So ISIS 2.0 is that. It's the online idea that and still lives. And is it lives. partially just online ideas that you know people just glom on to here and there? And or to what degree is it operating networks whether in Europe or other places, that actually plan and organize things. Well, the network uh, issue is, of course, something that's more covert and is known much more to the intelligence community than it is in the open source. But we do know that there is some of that still going on, but on a much lower level than it was only six months ago. But it's inevitable that some of that will continue. ISIS's fighters haven't all been killed. Neither have all of their external operations planners. So some of that activity will continue. But the bigger... Uh, more impactful reality is this kind of online reality that ISIS has been able to establish in people's minds. The caliphate was an, an exi- was well, something that there, existed. Is there a battle being waged now online and who's waging it? And are the good guys winning in a sense? I mean, okay, the battles in Mosul and then those were, you know, military operations. What are the outlines of the online battle? Well, the online battle has definitely become a new battle space, and it's something that both the business community and the governmental community are playing increasingly significant roles in. If you want my personal opinion, it's almost a it's it's a very important battle to sustain, but I don't think we'll ever entirely win it because it's always possible for our enemies to recreate content, to recreate accounts that we will then just have to continue to delete. So it's a battle that we should continue to fight, but it will continue to be played out. Mm -hmm. Um, It's also a battle that's that's moving more to sort of more private platforms. So whereas ISIS was um, the norm in 2014 and 15 was to use Twitter in the open, now they're turning to platforms like Telegram, which essentially you need to know the specific account name and you have Almost to... Almost private and, online networks. Private online yeah. networks, um, Let me which ask is you much before more we go on, because time is limited, uh, where does this leave Al-Qaeda, the original brand? Well, this is a really big question I've been working on a lot. So Al-Qaeda obviously still exists, obviously still plays significant roles all, all, all around the globe. Um, but it's starting to lose control of some of its ability to present itself as an organization rather than a movement. In Syria, for example, Al-Qaeda's relationship with its one-time affiliate Jabhat al-Nusra appears to be entirely dissolved. And most of that is because of at least allegations that Al-Qaeda was insufficiently in communication with its affiliate in Syria. Meanwhile, its affiliate in Syria was having to make faster and faster decisions on the ground to adapt to changing circumstances and wasn't able to take instruction from someone in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So it went on its own way. So it's an open question as to where that dynamic's going in the future. But there's definitely that open question about 
how valuable is it to still have a Al Qaeda central leadership in Afghanistan, Pakistan, in hiding, under the watch of drones, trying to centrally instruct affiliates all around the world on a day-to-day basis. How how much is that going to be able to sustain itself? So would you describe it currently as not as impactful as ISIS, a bit on the back foot, a bit splintered? Potentially, yeah. I mean, I still think Al-Qaeda is extremely dangerous. I mean, Al-Qaeda conducted the 9-11 attacks with, uh, you know, two dozen people max, with a fairly insignificant amount of money. Um, but with huge global ramifications. And that's still Al-Qaeda's model. They have tried to become more of a mass movement, but their idea of conducting attacks against the West has never really changed. And in terms of the the on-the-ground, we want to try and establish Islamic Emirates and one day a caliphate, as far as Al-Qaeda is concerned, that can take a thousand more years. The focus is on sustaining this more durable effort. And to, Mm -hmm. to me, that's actually just as dangerous as what ISIS represents, but from a more medium to long term perspective rather than the immediate short term one that ISIS posed more recently. Charles, more I recently. want to thank you very much. That's all the time we have for this segment. Uh, Charles Lister, director of our Extremism and Counterterrorism Project, uh, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you for being with us uh, on this end of year podcast. The uh, next podcast will be at the beginning of 2018 when we will look forward. Uh, to what we might see coming down the road in 2018 related to the Middle East. Wish everybody who's listening a uh, happy holidays and hopefully a good 2018. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.